These folks are just like you and me, except that they either live in an occupied territory or are second class Israeli citizens. They are Arabs, both Palestinians and Bedouins, but because of that, many Israelis consider them the enemy. There are extreme and horrific situations that many Palestinians and Israeli Bedouins suffer at the hands of the Israeli government, but all suffer very specific humiliations and hardships. This presentation shows some of the typical day to day situations that the Palestinians and Bedouins must endure living under Israeli occupation. Israel began construction of the separation wall in 2002. Some parts of the wall are 25 feet high. This is part of the wall separating occupied Palestinian East Jerusalem from Israeli West Jerusalem. Lookout towers like this are located at various intervals along the wall. When completed, the wall will be about 450 miles long, but the border between Israel and the West Bank is only 120 miles. The map shows how it curls around inside the West Bank, creating a barrier for over 100 villages and enclaves. Thousands of people have been cut off from their land and resources, water wells and cisterns, and are being isolated from their communities. Thousands of jobs have been lost, health clinics have been isolated from their communities, and many students are unable to continue their education. Israel continues to seize the land of Palestine. These photos from a slideshow produced by Stop the Wall, a Palestinian NGO, show how the wall has annexed Palestinian land, cutting through communities, greenhouses, irrigation pipes and buildings, and destroying over 100,000 olive and citrus trees that have been in families for generations. The wall has been painted with graffiti throughout the West Bank. Separation fences are also used within cities in this case, a fence in the West Bank city of Hebron is used to separate a Palestinian area from an urban Israeli settlement. There's a Palestinian cemetery on the Israeli side that the Palestinians can no longer get to. At places, the wall, instead of concrete, is made up of razor wire, a trench, and an electrified fence with cameras and motion devices. There are gates in some areas with signs showing the times they will be open. Sometimes they are open, sometimes not. The opening of gates is critical to farmers who need to get their produce from land they are working. If they can't get through the gate, which happens often, their produce rots. The family of this Palestinian house, adjacent to an Israeli settlement, would not move, so the Israelis surrounded it with an electrified fence the interior of the house with two of the kids who live there. The adjacent Israeli settlement. You can see part of the fence surrounding the home and a camera focused on the house. The fence surrounds the house and has gates with cameras, sound and motion detectors and even a timing device so that even the boy returning from school is recorded. One of the boys on the roof, behind him is the wall separating the village from the Israeli settlement. 
the location of this wall annexed or destroyed seven water wells owned by the village. The wall was painted by Palestinian children. A poster in the office of the NGO stopped the wall. These Israeli superhighways have been constructed for the Israeli settlers to facilitate their easy access between settlements and to and from Israel. Palestinians are generally prohibited from using them. These roads prevent the expansion and development of Palestinian towns, prevent Palestinians from going directly to their destinations, and they cut off areas making it impossible for Palestinians to use their land. They are bordered on both sides with electrified fences. These are the roads the Palestinians have to use. This extended Palestinian family lives in a small town just south of Bethlehem. The husband is an engineer who works in Ramallah. Normally, this is a 30-minute drive, but because of the circuitous route and checkpoints, it takes three hours. At times, because the checkpoints are capriciously closed, he can't get there at all. Because of this, he had to rent an apartment in Ramallah where he stays, seeing his family only on weekends. His brother, shown here in a photo, was killed in the first intifada. He was walking down the street with a friend in Bethlehem when an Israeli soldier came up and told him to stay there and that he would be right back. His friend got scared and ran away. When the soldier returned, he stuck his rifle in his side and killed him. He had done nothing. They're a middle-class family and built a lovely house along with other friends who built theirs. For seven years, they guarded the construction of their houses 24 hours a day, taunted and threatened by Israeli soldiers that they would demolish them. Their house is on the other side of the fence that borders an Israeli settlement seen in the distance. The empty space in front of the settlement is typical and provides the Israelis with room for expansion. The fence that is right in front of their home is so highly electrified they saw a dog who touched it blown to bits. Also, you can see in the foreground how the fence cuts off the grove of olive trees that was theirs. You can tell these are typical Palestinian apartment buildings because of the water tanks on the roofs. They are necessary because their water is often turned off by the Israelis who control about 75% of the water resources in the occupied territories. Israelis use between four and six times what a Palestinian uses, and the settlers have no restrictions whatsoever. Palestinians cannot dig new wells and are restricted on amounts used in existing ones. On the other hand, this is an Israeli settler in the West Bank, standing in front of his house and lovely gardens, nurtured by a free flow of as much water as he wants. Most checkpoints, which supposedly are to secure the Israeli border, are located within the West Bank, not on the border. There are over 700 checkpoints, roadblocks, gates, and mounds within the West Bank. Here, permits issued to Palestinians are inspected. These permits limit and obstruct almost all aspects of living a normal life. Among them, where they may travel to, where they may work, obtain health care and education, the roads they can drive on, restrictions on the house they want to build or renovate, and what merchandise they can import or export. Obtaining permits for many of these things are difficult and most often impossible to acquire and may be rescinded at any time. Because taxis are not allowed through the checkpoints, people have to get out of the taxi, walk across the checkpoint, and get into another one. I was on this line of cars for an hour and a half trying to leave Hebron. When we finally got to the checkpoint, the Israeli soldiers were eating their lunch. There was no other reason to close the checkpoint. They capriciously opened and closed them to harass the Palestinians. This checkpoint is in the city of Hebron. 
Young Palestinian school children have to pass by in order to get to their school. We were told that the Israeli soldiers typically point their guns at the children as they pass by. Ramallah is a Palestinian city of 300,000. The main road in and out of the city has an Israeli checkpoint. People can be stuck in these checkpoints for hours. This frustration breeds signs like this in the center of Ramallah. Since 1967, over 27,000 homes have been demolished and over 15,000 severely damaged. It is required to have a permit from Israel to build on your land in the West Bank. Israel, however, will not issue them, so the Palestinians have no choice but to build anyway. The Israeli authorities, whenever they want, can issue a vacate order and demolish the house. Also, as a collective punishment, houses belonging to relatives of those suspected of involvement in attacks are demolished. These are punitive demolitions and are a violation of international law. These posters are in the office of Adamir, a Palestinian NGO working for the freeing and humanitarian treatment of Palestinians incarcerated in Israeli prisons. Since 1967, there have been over 650,000 Palestinians detained, which is 20% of the population in the occupied territories and 40% of the male population. Israeli soldiers have taken over the top floor and roof of a private Palestinian house in Hebron in order to construct a military lookout post. They can simply go into a house and tell the family to vacate what areas they want to use. This is the tomb of Abraham. Since he is important to both Jews and Muslims, there are entrances on opposite sides of the building for each religion. This is the Jewish side, guarded by soldiers. Just before entering, there's a checkpoint where you're asked to leave your firearms on the table. This is because many Israelis carry a gun. Because the Israelis wanted to build a shorter, more direct road to the tomb of Abraham for Israelis, occupied Palestinian historic buildings were destroyed. Some archaeologists have said these buildings should have been a World Heritage Site in Hebron. Although people still live there, streets were blocked off with 55-gallon drums filled with concrete. This is the old market area in Hebron. There are Jewish settlers in existing houses bordering the market area, and to harass the Palestinians, they throw trash from their windows into the market. The Palestinians have had to place nets over the open spaces to catch the garbage. Many shops are closing because of continued harassment and violence. Other forms of harassment degrade Mohammed. This graffiti says Mohammed is a pig. Concrete obstacles are placed on the street to hinder vehicle traffic. Streets are barricaded, making it impossible to drive on a main street from a side street. Here an Israeli army vehicle is tailing a young Muslim student. Within the old city, people of different religions have been living together for centuries. There are Muslim, Jewish, Christian, and Armenian sections. This is the West, or Wailing Wall, of Old Jerusalem. Prior to his stroke, Sharon bought a house in the Muslim quarters of Old Jerusalem, at which it is said he has never slept in, but has hung a flag to harass the Muslims. Because of financial difficulties due to harassment at a preschool these kids attend, the teachers on the children's birthday have photos of a cake instead of a real cake for each month with photos on the side of the children who have a birthday during that month. 
Many Israeli soldiers patrol the Muslim quarter of the old city. This is the Israeli village of Ein Had. Prior to 1948, it was a 700-year-old Palestinian village. As a result of the war, Israeli forces expelled most of the villagers, and in 1954, it was repopulated by Israelis as an artist colony. Those Palestinians that remained settled on their previously owned pasture land. Israel did not recognize this new Palestinian village until 2005. Until then, its houses were considered illegal. They received no government services such as water, electricity, sewage, health clinics, schools, etc. Many of the residents now work as gardeners and construction laborers in their former village. There are about 90,000 Arabs still living in 176 unrecognized villages in Israel. These old photos are the original camps established by the United Nations in 1948. They were originally set up for tents, but over the years people built concrete houses and as populations increased, there was no place to go but up. These camps are now some of the most densely populated areas in the world. In many cases, streets are alleyways so narrow it's hard to get through. There are a few places for kids to play or youth to play soccer. People try to make the best of a hard life. Water is supplied only three times a week. Medical aid is limited. There are surprise Israeli army incursions at night harassing and injuring people. There are house demolitions and there are at times a feeling of having no future. Many walls in the camps are painted or posted with images of martyrs, young men that have been killed during the occupation. There are also murals showing the support there is for the Palestinians in Gaza. And the world famous graffiti and stencil artist Banksy has also left his print on the walls of the camps. Yet there is a resistance to this illegal occupation and a proudness in the people that is apparent within minutes of meeting them. Street commerce continues and there's an active social life.
About 70,000 Bedouin who have resisted this forced relocation live in villages that remain unrecognized. Conditions are intolerable. They are constantly harassed, receive no electricity, no water, there are no paved roads, no health facilities, limited schools, and all buildings are subject to demolition. Thousands have been demolished. Israeli armament, testing sites, air bases, chemical and electrical plants are built near these villages, compromising their health. There are increased cancer rates, miscarriages, birth defects, asthma, and skin diseases. In the Bedouin village of Al Arakid, the community has set up temporary men's and women's tents to deter the government from taking their land so as to protect their homes and way of life. The children remain there and go to classes set up temporarily in tents. Israeli government has demolished thousands of homes in the Bedouin communities. This is a typical village and a house constructed of tin sheets in a Bedouin community. And this is a house in the Jewish community of Omer, one of the richest in Israel, less than half a mile from a Bedouin community. It has two pools, recreation areas, and landscape parks. Bedouins, however, are a proud, dignified people who will continue to resist as they have for 60 years until they are able to, once again, live their traditional life of respect and love for the land. Shatila is one of these camps. In 1982, during the Lebanese Civil War, Israeli forces allowed Christian phalangist militiamen to enter the camp and carry out a massacre of Palestinian refugees. As in many refugee camps, as populations grew, so did the height of buildings. The conditions in the camp are terrible. Water and electric lines are suspended between buildings. Palestinians are derived of many basic human rights barred from many job categories, including professions. They are not allowed to own property. They need a special permit to leave the camp, and they are denied access to the health system. So these are the conditions, but regardless, the Palestinians live the best they can, whether in Israel, the occupied territories of the West Bank and Gaza, or in Lebanon. They retain their dignity, stay strong against many odds, and are determined to gain their freedom. A solution must be found. These children must have a future. They must be able to live a life that allows for their potential, their dignity, and hope.